I think everybody has joined on Zoom. Um, and welcome for everyone who's in the room as well. Thank you for coming along tonight. For those of you who haven't met before, I'm Clara, Member Engagement Manager at The Inn. Tonight, we'll be discussing the pathway to pupillage um, and ways to boost your pupillage application, various different opportunities that our lovely panel have done. And so the talk will, will last around an hour and then we will have a Q&A session so you get to ask some questions. If you have got any questions for our panel, if you're in the room, just raise your hand. We'll come over with a mic. And if you're on Zoom, please type them into the Q&A button, which will be fielded by Adam, our chair. Please don't use the chat function for the questions. So I'm now going to hand you over to Adam Kayani, a barrister at Harcourt Chambers. He was a member of the INS Junior Members Committee and Adam will be chairing tonight's event. Great, thank you, Clara. Good evening, everyone who's here in person and everyone who's here in the ether. Um, this is, as Clara says, the Pathways to Pupillage event. So the key thing here is the pathway. We are talking about various different careers, jobs, experiences, things that we've all done that have led us either just to the door of pupillage or um, in some of our cases, far beyond it into the uh, exciting realms of practice. So the key part about today's event is we're not, and I know how close we are to the gateway deadline. We're not necessarily here to talk about gateway forms and the best way to answer gateway application questions or indeed uh, interview prep. Though, of course, any questions you guys have about general application type issues, I'm sure there'll be time to either come and talk to us at the end about it uh, or kind of email any one of us on the panel. I'm sure any one of us would be very happy to help you in your specific areas. As Clara says, I'm a barrister at Harcourt Chambers, so that's family law. We've got pretty much, I think, the full range uh, of practice areas along the panel tonight. So you'll be able to hear from lots of different people from all over the profession. So I hope uh, every single one of you in various different guises will get something out of today. First things from me, if we could just have a show of hands, how many of you are bar students? Anyone? Okay, quite a lot. Any undergrad students, any really keen undergrads? Okay, there we go. We've got at least one. And I'm sure there's probably more online. And then do we have hands up everybody else? Don't want to leave you out. Good. <laughs> Welcome to everybody else. Okay. So I hope that this event is going to be useful to all of you in different ways, no matter where you are on your pathway. And to help us with that, we have an excellent panel, um, other than me. We've got uh, <laughs> Dilpreet, who is at Fieldcourt Chambers, Fieldcourt Tax Chambers, who completed a scholar role with Deutsche Bank and UBS in New York for a year, and also had a role with Deloitte's tax and legal disputes team as part of their graduate intake. So as you can tell, Dilpreet does a lot of tax, so if you're interested in that, <laughs> can have a chat to her. We're going to hear from Matt Tim, he's going to give you a wave, give a wave, Matt. <laughs> yeah, he's a researcher at the Law Commission. We've got Sam, who is at DAC Beechcroft. Uh, who uh, is going to talk to us about the job of a county court advocate. It's a very fun job. I did that, not for DAC Beechcroft, but it's a, a good job, and we're going to hear a lot from Sam on that. And we've got Harriet, who is a judicial assistant at the Court of Appeal as well. Good. So as I say, Clara uh, has said that there's going to be time for questions. If you want, if we're going to basically go through a, a period where everyone's going to give a short 10-ish minutes uh, kind of spiel about what they do, why they do it, uh, and why it's got them in their wonderful careers thus far. If we can hold fire on questions until they've done their little segments, I will give you an opportunity to ask specific questions to that specific person, and then we'll move on through all the people, and then we will go through a generic kind of questions and answer session, and then uh, I'm sure there will be a bit of time afterwards for milling around and talking to us generally. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pick on Matt. I've given him no warning that he was going to be the fourth <laughs> one. Uh, so if he looks slightly terrified, that's for good reason. But uh, yeah, let's hear from Matt first. Hi, I'm uh, Matt. I did law at Newcastle University. And then following that, I uh, was kind of sick of doing four years of law. So I thought I'd go to the other side of the world and lived in New Zealand for two years. And then the pandemic hit. So sadly, I had to come back to the UK and did the bar course at BPP in London. And then following that, I uh, joined the Law Commission in July last year. And I'm still there now. And I have pupillage uh, starting next year at 42 uh, Bedford Row, which is a uh, mixed civil practice. And so really, I'm here to talk about the Law Commission and what we do there and how it really helped boost my applications. Um, just on uh, how I got on with the Gateway, I applied over the bar course year, didn't do very well, only got one first round interview. And then when I applied, having been at the Law Commission, um, I had way more. And then that's the year that I got pupillage. And so at the commission, um, it's a really great opportunity just to, first of all, get down to uh, London. From myself, I'm from uh, Cheshire and I studied at Newcastle. So 
I didn't actually have any ties to uh, London. I didn't know anyone who was a barrister or a solicitor. And so there's 18 research assistants, uh, near or less, who all start at the same time throughout the year. And so you have this real community of people who have similar career paths um, and some want to be barristers, some want to be solicitors, but you can really rely on them. And it's just a great way to get down to London and start figuring out what you're interested in, what you want to do. And so at the commission, what we do is we reform the law and we have four different teams who all do things slightly differently. Um, I'm in the public law team and mostly what we do is transport. And so the projects that I was on um, was self-driving cars, which super sexy. Every interview I had, every barrister asked me about that. They were like, when, <laughs> when is Back to the Future going to happen? And when are we going to have them? And when I told them that I tried one in Greenwich and it was like a learner driver and it couldn't deal with absolutely anything, they were slightly surprised. Um, and then the next project I did was remote driving. So because self-driving technology isn't quite there yet, if a car is being remotely controlled by someone who could be in a foreign country and never um, having driven on British roads. So these are the sort of big issues that we're dealing with. And so on a day-to-day -day level, uh, what do we do? Well, the big thing is legal research. And the way that crops up for me would be there would be an issue and it would be, well, how do we deal with it? And so if you can imagine um, that you have a, a vehicle currently and it's described as self-driving, but actually the features aren't at, up to that level yet, what sort of problems could that cause? And we've, we found that it's so confusing at the minute, the technology in cars and what the capabilities are that end users actually don't really understand the technology. And so you could uh, think you're using certain technology on a motorway and really if you're not paying attention, you could cause injury to other, other road users. Um, and so that was the issue I was given with, given. So my uh, lawyer said, right, how do we solve this? And so looked all around the world and because it's so new, no one had done uh, anything. And so it was really a clean slate which in law is so exciting that you can actually be creative and do something different. And so in that scenario, I was like, well, I think we need criminal offences to try and stop companies from calling something self-driving unless it actually is. And so I looked at lots of different legislation, um, such as to do with the words royal or taxi and when they're allowed to be used. And I use that as an example to say the word self-driving should be banned in marketing unless a, a vehicle has been authorised. And so I went on this whole iterative process that first of all, it was a research memo. Then um, it went through to like my lawyer and commissioner. And then from that, I drafted the chapter that ended up in the report, which was then given to government who are now um, looking to implement that. And so that will be in the criminal statute book. Um, and my criminal colleagues, one day when they're prosecuting that, I can say that was me way back <laughs> in 2021, 2022, who came up with that. And so you're actually dealing with real life issues and having to be creative and really think about really think about these complex things and how how they can be solved. And so that's why it's great because there's no other legal job like it. It's really applying your mind to really big issues that you have lots of different experts in the commission from all walks of life, but you bring your own unique experience. And it's just this really collaborative process to take the law, see what's wrong with it, see what needs to be improved and put out what we think is um, a good product. And I'm sure lots of you have like read the Law Commission reports. We have um, a really good reputation both in Whitehall and in the, in the legal community. And so from being at the Commission, what I learned, why do I think I got all of the interviews and why did I get pupillage? Well, I think it really just taught me how to write clearly and coherently because it goes through so much moderation and every piece of work I do will be looked at by three or four people. I started to just write in shorter sentences, get to the point, cut the waffle, all of those sort of things, which then when I was writing my applications, I applied the same, the same mindset that the work that goes into producing a law commission report, I applied to all my applications and made sure is it easy to read, have I used bullet points, all of those things that the presentation just means anyone who picks it up, they know exactly what I'm on about and it's super clear. Um, also persuasion, um, the, the commissioners at the top, they have had really esteemed careers. A lot of them have been in practice and the chair is a court of appeal judge. And when you have to go into a room and convince them that we need new criminal offences when the law commission 
is trying to reform the law and create less or tidy up the statute book you really have to stick to your guns and explain why you need it and it can seem intimidating but it's quite a friendly environment um, and but persuading them is great practice to then get to an interview and try and uh, persuade a panel why you should get pupillage and then the other thing is comparative analysis you look all across the world at different jurisdictions and what they're doing uh, and so i'm an expert in transport law in france and germany in america i think we got as far as japan but then the uh, language barrier was getting <laughs> quite difficult <laughs> um, so but just doing that process you just you, you see it makes you look at your at the law here differently and you can just i can look through regulations now and know like exactly where to look like where the interpretation section the actual crucial core parts uh, what what is actually turning on the you like the words used and all of these is great experience across the board like no matter what area of practice you end up in um and then another thing is just presenting complex policy to lots of different people at the commission it's all about engagement we when we make recommendations it's because we have spoken to so many different people and we're interested in hearing well what are their experiences with the law how has it helped them or what gets in the way and so just on the self-driving project we would speak to uh, developers in silicon valley and you always knew when you're speaking to them because they all look like steve jobs so busy <laughs> Um, but they would just want no regulation whatsoever. They just want to put cars on the road and make as much money as possible. And then the next day you would go and speak to uh, road safety groups who would say, this is a crazy idea. Like, have you thought about all of the different kinds of road users and um, people with disabilities? How are they going to interact with these vehicles? And so you have to kind of balance the policy idea and the outcome, but then you have to present it to all these different groups. And so it's about explaining it in a super clear way and being able to get their opinion and take that on board and uh, produce like a really good product at the end. And so it's completely fascinating. And I would encourage as many of you um, or all of you to apply because it really just prepared me for for, um, the, for my the application process of pupillage and just being able to present myself and go through back through my CV and think if I was a law commission project, how would I present this? What what would be my headline points and it just makes you think um in in a different way which is just great for getting people edge it's really competitive so i would advise we have an event on the first of december i can share i can share the link with clara and um, come along to that and just ask as many questions as you can we usually get between 500 to a thousand applications for 18 places uh, the key things are legal research being able to uh, communicate effectively um, persuading someone of your point of view but if you have all of those I really would say um, apply because it's just such a unique role uh, and even if you are unsure about whether you really do want to be a barrister it then it opens up your mind to how the government makes law and how policy is made and you work with lots of different departments um, and lots of different stakeholders that it can just broaden your horizons in ways that are, are uh, amazing just for one of your first jobs in London and um, so that was my little spiel yeah great thank you so much Matt. one question I had that just jump, jumped out you mentioned that it was quite a few applicants for the job can you just talk a little bit about what the application process was yeah so um it's a paper application first and then a situational judgment test which is just a day in the life of being a research assistant and it's just things such as what you prioritize so there'd be like a really bad example that if you get a email from a stakeholder asking you to asking you to do something do you delete it like the answer is no um and then it's, it's not too like it shouldn't be too difficult and then following that there is a written exercise which again is just about how you distill and process information and it you just get given um a document that has spelling mistakes in that sort of thing and it's whether you're picking up on that and then just presenting something clearly so that someone else can understand it um, and then there's an interview and then you're finally made offers um, but throughout it, I think the big thing for the Law Commission, the thing that I've learned that has really helped me towards getting pupillage is just presentation. Present everything so clearly, cut down on words, don't use any jargon, don't use elaborate words, just say what you want to say. And if you go and read uh, any Law Commission report from the last, however, like 50 years, if you can treat your pupillage applications or whatever applications you're doing or any work that you do if you have that mindset then it just stands you in such great stead for practice 
but at least I hope when I'm in front of a scary judge and they're like, what do you mean here? Um, but that's why my key takeaway would be for applying for the Law Commission and the future is presentation. Just make it so clear that anyone can pick it up and understand what you are saying. And in terms of what you specifically did for, did you do any specific prep for applying to the Law Commission or did you just sort of take it as it? As it um, yeah, so so we have this uh, big central event which go along and speak to the relevant teams because each team does things slightly differently and you have to show why you're interested in their project. So um, for me, there's like a, a corporate and common law team, which I don't even, that might even not be the wrong name, might be commercial. That just shows how interested I am in that, not very. <laughs> um, it's criminal, which it was really juicy, all the juicy topics, but I didn't want to practice in criminal. Um, and then saw self-driving cars and I was like, yes, let's do it. So there, I think that's why I got the job. Um, but they we do lots of great stuff that you can just call a research assistant in January before the application window closes to ask more information. And um, you've all met me tonight, like feel free to like send me an email, but just speak to current research assistants or come along and talk to us. And then you just have an idea of what the role is so you can hit the ground running when it comes to writing that paper application. Um, and you know exactly what the role is to be then to be able to apply your skills and sell yourself. Great. Thanks, Matt. And one of the things from my own personal experience is I, I didn't do the job with the Law Commission, but even once I'm in practice, I became a stakeholder for the Law Commission, talking to them about contempt. I don't practice in contempt specifically. I have no uh, you know, specific qualifications in it. But the fact is that I saw that they were um, asking for stakeholders. I replied to a questionnaire and then suddenly I was in front of all those scary commissioners that Matt was just talking about, uh, talking to them about contempt. So the Law Commission is a really interesting organization that, as Matt says, covers such a wide range of topics and is an organization that you really can engage with even into practice, either responding to questionnaires or calls for evidence or um, giving your views on topics you're entirely unqualified to talk about. Do exactly. <laughs> so we have any questions specifically for Matt, either online, I can't see any, but um, in person, have we got anything specifically about the Law Commission, the application process, the job, or anything about Matt in particular? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that there's different teams that you're doing, and um, you pick one that was more aligned with your yeah. interests. Do you think that? Affects sort of where you'll be applying to people with that sort of in terms of specialism. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. If you really love your area, great. But if you don't, then that's the reason why. So, say for example, if I had a criminal, I could say, actually, it really wasn't for me. And then at the commission, we constantly peer review. So, the reason why the work's so good is that I will look at the criminal um, law report going out and then I will comment on it as someone who hasn't looked at it whatsoever. And so, I can then, when like all of those opportunities come around and you have a chance to, like digital assets was one. And so I was reading this chapter on crypto. I was just like, thank God I do not have to do this ever again. <laughs> but if I was interested in that, I could put myself forward for all these opportunities. And if you then are interested, everyone's so friendly and it's all about getting you to the next place because it's only a one year position that you can go and speak to those lawyers. And then when it comes around to the application process, you can say, whilst I was on this project, I did all of this work. Um, and this is where my interest lies. And it just gives you such a breadth of the law that you can then justify either wanting to, for me, I, that's why I'm doing a mixed practice because self-driving cars was so big. It touched so many different areas that I was like, actually, I'm not too sure where I want to land just yet. So I want to try a few different areas. Um, so it's just, it completely depends, but there's the opportunity to try a bit of everything and then you can start to narrow down or just help that to justify your answer. Right, thank you. Chiming in again with more anecdotes, I, in fact, did um, Sam's job, but for a different organisation in purely civil law, and now I do family law. So that should tell you that really it's all about skills that you find, for example, legal writing or research or yeah. development, that you can then take into your specific area of practice or applications later on, rather than the actual subject matter itself. Though, of course, subject matters uh, probably matter. Um, we have an online question from Rory. If you're interested um he says thanks matt for speaking so interestingly about your work what research experience did you have before applying to the commission um because he, he's as he says rightly it's a difficult world to break into and he's had uh, uh some struggles in applying it seems so i think the question is what research experience if any did you have before applying to the law commission yeah so uh, quite a few of the research assistants i have done a master's which i think helps and gives um an example to show but i personally didn't do a master's 
I uh, did a dissertation, but I think you need something more than that. Quite a lot of people have done a dissertation at undergraduate. And so when I was in New Zealand, I did um, paralegal experience. And so a lot of my work there, I also volunteered for uh, Bernardo's and a lot of the family law system in New Zealand is based on the English system, but it doesn't quite fit with the Maori culture. And so I did this huge piece of work um, to do with how, say, the nuclear model of a family here doesn't work there, that you may have grandparents who want to um, raise the child, all of this. And it's the whole tribe that helps raise a, a child in New Zealand. So just talking about that comparative analysis really helps and was interesting enough to get me uh, an interview where I could explain it more. So. I think just doing um, paralegal experience, but really like honing in on the research, like what was it exactly that you did? What was the issue? What sources? Who did you speak to? And how does that all relate to um, the job? And if that is in something that is loosely relevant to a project we're working on, then you should be in good stead. But I think it's just having a really clear method of what the research was, what you did, what you learned from it, rather than just talking really high level um, that I think you need that level of detail to show that you you can take on a big piece of research and produce a good end product. Excellent, thanks Matt. I think that's all we have time for questions for the second because we've just got to move on now to Samuel. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Sam. Uh, I did uh, my undergrad at the University of Bristol and stayed there for a panic masters. I don't know if <laughs> anyone has recent experience of that uh, during COVID especially. Um, so that was that was fun. So four years in Bristol, um, and yeah, I'll I'll talk a little bit in in the round about my general experience, and then more specifically about what I'm here to talk about, uh, which is county court advocacy. Um, but uh, as part of my masters in Bristol, one of the things I did was get involved with the local law centre, Bristol Law Centre. Um, and I would wholeheartedly recommend getting involved with law centres as a way of getting uh, on your feet or real case management experience, um, particularly um, fresh out of university when you've not had a great deal of opportunity to get stuck into real life legal work yet. Um, and that was really valuable. And that was in a advocacy role as well. And, and those are a little bit few and further between, but if you can get experience doing court advocacy through a law center or a similar organization like the uh, the free, free representation unit doing stuff like social security appeals or uh, I think through also does employment um, employment tribunal work as well that's a really good way to get um, on your feet legal experience at an early point in your career um, so, so that was that was my time in Bristol. Uh, after that, I did the bar course and I did that remotely uh, in London. And I was very foolish to do so because I paid the London fee uh, and have never been to University of Law in Bl Bloomsbury. So um, I could have saved myself a couple of thousand pounds there. But there we go. Um, I've, I've let it go, as you, as you can probably <laughs> tell. Um, Yes, and, and during during that, um, obviously, as most of you will know, um, that's a really interesting time. Um, and you learn so much about advocacy and, and civil and criminal litigation in general during the bar course. Um, but I wanted to go a little bit beyond that as well. And so one of the things I did towards the end of the course was get some paralegaling experience. And I do think that's a really valuable thing to do in terms of, again, building on that post-university mindset to get some real hands-on legal work experience um, now at that point and I, I think still to an extent um, my ideal direction would be civil or commercial and I don't know if that's the same for anyone else in the room um, but for me um, I thought about if I want to and I must stress actually I should have said this at the outset I don't have pupillage um, so I am very much listening to everyone else on the panel's <laughs> comments as as eagerly as the rest of you. Um, so, but I guess I'm here to talk about what, what, what the sort of things you can do to help your chances of getting there. And yeah, the, the, the legal work experience in civil litigation as a paralegal, I thought was really quite valuable as well, um, because it allowed me to gain, if not a practical insight of what a junior civil commercial barrister does, at least immerse myself in the sort of work they might be doing so I could gain an insight into understanding uh, small claims and fast track claims and 
the broader civil procedure um, that goes with those sorts of things. Um, I was doing it in, in PPI, so um, that was perhaps not the most interesting practice area, um, but certainly if you want to become a civil commercial uh, barrister, uh, and indeed I think there's some county court advocates that do that sort of work, it really is a fairly large practice area that leads to um, quite a lot of cases in, in quite a lot of lists around county courts in the country. You do see a lot of PPI cases. So in terms of trying to leverage your, your knowledge base, I, I thought that was a, a good opportunity. And that's why I did that. And I, I would recommend thinking strategically in that way about if you don't have an idea, at least of the sort of work you want to do at the moment, perhaps thinking what sort of cases or, or what sort of skills are junior barristers in the areas that I might want to go into? Uh, what sort of things are they doing? Uh, how can I gain access to that sort of skill and, and that sort of capital, essentially? Um, and then after um, my time at, uh, doing PPI litigation, which was which was wonderful and 11 months long, I, I managed to get um, a position doing county court advocacy. Um, and I'm doing that at DAC Beechcroft. And um, county court advocacy is something that you can do within law firms. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And I'd say there are, I think there's about three law firms that I know about that have in-house chambers and that's perhaps something of a contentious topic uh, within the, the legal market more generally. But in terms of being at the level that I and by, by extension, I guess, we are at in trying to leverage skills um, towards applying for pupillage, uh, working in-house at a solicitor's firm that does have an in-house advocacy unit, such as DAC Beechcroft or... I think DWF also have an in-house chambers, and I think Erwin Mitchell are also uh, looking to start up uh, an in-house chambers as well in the near future. Um, that is a really good way of getting on your feet advocacy experience before um, pupillage. And certainly my experience of applying for pupillage thus far has been, how can I, um, how can I show myself uh, suitable um, as a candidate that would be able to step into the shoes of, the, of a pupil barrister fairly quickly. And I think getting on your feet advocacy experience is, is a really good way of marking yourself apart from other people, um, he says, hopefully, um, <laughs> in applications for pupillage in the future. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of that job, county court advocacy more generally, I would really recommend that. And I said, I've talked about the the different providers um, in house at solicitors firms, but Adam, I think you were mm. at LPC Law. I was, yeah. um, there are also other providers. I think Quest mm. um, Legal Advocates is one of the ones that springs to mind. No doubt there are a number of other ones as well, but I think those are the main players. And my understanding of at least LPC is that they train you up to do in person advocacy mm. hearings in the county courts, perhaps start you off with more procedural matters um or more minimal substantive lots matters. of mortgage possessions mortgage possessions is what i've heard as well yes, yeah lots of mortgage possessions mm. um but that can be a really good opportunity to get yourself in court and observing other cases and getting before a judge and, and getting that really stressful first courtroom experience out of the way before pupillage and getting stories that you can talk about as part of a pupillage application mm -hmm. process as well. Um, because in my job already, I've, I've been in several situations where I've been in courts and something as it does in courts, very weird has happened that no one's expected to happen. Um, in my time at Bristol Law Centre, um, I was uh, in a situation where my client or the person I was representing um, had uh, an anxiety attack when we were in the hearing and being able to deal with those situations with presence of mind is a skill that you can really take forwards in certain situations um, into pupillage as well as being uh, a pretty good life skill in general I would, I would suggest um, and so it's it's about I think as everyone's going to say it's about the skills of what you're doing rather than actually what you're doing 
and you can gain relevant skills and experience from a lot of different avenues. And I guess that's why we've got such a diverse panel here today. Um, but in terms of counter advocacy as well, one of the benefits of doing that sort of work is an opportunity as well as doing oral advocacy in court, which is really valuable and very important to, to do if you can to make yourself stand apart, but also availability of drafting instructions as well, which is something that I had precious little experience of before the bar course and still have far too little experience of. Um, drafting is a little bit of an art form that I've not quite mastered yet. Um, but that is a really big part of paperwork practice. It's a really big part of, of civil and commercial practice more generally. And as I've said, that's the ideal direction I'd like to go in. So thinking strategically about the sort of skills in your preferred area, um, I guess would be my main takeaway because so far that stood me in pretty good stead in bouncing from one job to another and trying, um, trying in the best way possible to try and upskill myself so that when I come to the next application process, I can actually talk about what I've learned in, in the time since I've applied previously and essentially how I can market myself as um, a future, a future pupil barrister and, and hopefully a capable one. Um, so that would be my yeah. main takeaway. Does yeah. anyone have any specific? Well, again, I've, I've got a couple. Um, my first one is, I suppose a lot of people's first question would be, well, what stage do you have to be in order to do county court advocacy? Do you, do you need a law degree? Do you need a the BPTC or whatever it's called now? Is it still called a BPTC? I think it's called BTC. BTC now. They just keep dropping and adding letters all over the shop. Okay, so the I think, BTC. I think I did the BPC. I, I so did the BPC. I, yeah, so I hey, right. Throw that one into the ring as well. Alphabet suit. Yeah, okay. There we are. So um, what qualifications do you actually need in order to be a county court advocate? Um, I think most county court advocacy places, um, certainly DAC Beechcroft require people to have done the bar course. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same at LPC was, as well. Yeah. So I think... For most people in the room, that might be a good next step if you're looking to get on your feet legal experience and, and you've not got it already. Um, that would be potentially a really valuable thing to do. Um, I think it would perhaps be quite a daunting thing to do mm. fresh out of university. And to an extent, I think the procedural knowledge that the bar course instills in you is, is necessary for mm. doing that job mm. in terms of making applications for relief or anything that crops up like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would I would recommend thinking about that if you're thinking about getting some on your feet experience. And in terms of DAC in particular, I think you mentioned that they've got an in-house pupillage scheme. Is that right? Can yes. You tell everyone a bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so um, very recently, um, the bar council gave DAC Beechcroft um, uh, an exemption from the pupillage timetable mm -hmm. to advertise for um, pupillage, and that's something that's been open. And I think may have closed actually last week yeah. um so this event or perhaps the people nice try perhaps <laughs> the pupillage application window for that is the ill-timed thing rather than mm. this event um but yes um no doubt they'll be advertising again soon because they've been really keen to get um pupils in um and to an extent the model relies on having people that progress from county court advocacy to pupillage so that i i assume will be open again in the near future so those, I think, are job alerts you can register for on the DAC Beechcroft Careers website, which if you're thinking about um, an interim career before pupillage in county court advocacy and you want the, the, the security of being employed, and, and that's perhaps one difference I should have mm. talked about compared to LPC law as well. When you work in-house at a firm such as DAC Beechcroft, like I do, um, I'm employed, whereas I think LPC law and quest you're paid as a self-employed contractor so you're paid per hearing you do which I, I think unfortunately is why they stack your diary full of mortgage possessions yeah. <laughs> um, because you need to do probably five of them in a day to um to pay your rent more um, than five <laughs> <laughs> um but I'm doing uh, a real variety of work at DAC as opposed to mortgage possessions I think to talk a little bit about the work that we do um DAC Beechcroft is um, a full service law firm, but it has a lot of clients who are insurance companies. And so one of the main things that we do is defend an insurance work in situations, a lot of road traffic accidents where uh, someone has either uh, 
cause damage to someone else's car, obviously, which is uh, a necessary consequence of an accident or damage to another person. So person injury as well. Um, and quite often those are not liability disputed and, and sometimes they are liability disputed as well. So there is a fairly good range of experience there of doing a full liability mm -hmm. trial, um, albeit at the small claims track because rights of audience do only stretch so far. Mm -hmm. um, and also doing uh, quantum trials as well, which to an extent is slightly uh, more pressure off because you know that you're going to be have to paying out something. So uh, at that point, it's an exercise in minimization. Uh, and obviously, there are, there are various means of doing that, um, uh, minimizing quantum and, and also assessment of damages hearings as well. Um, so I'd say the, the, the sort of work that is, is done certainly where I am, but I would suspect um, other employed um, in-house chambers as well would focus on that fairly uh, general civil law work. So your personal injury, um, your credit hire, which is what we do a lot of. Um, and it may not sound perhaps too sexy. Um, and I would probably agree with you on that. It's not, um, it's not the sort of work you wake up in the morning uh, bouncing out of bed, perhaps like a human rights lawyer would, or perhaps maybe that's just me imagining how a human rights lawyer gets out of bed. <laughs> Um, but it, again, coming back to the central point, um, the skills that you get from doing core advocacy, regardless of what it is, is what's mm -hmm. going to stand to you potentially in a great stead uh, for talking about what you've done and situations you've been in. Um, so that's, yeah. Great. I should say in defence of LPC law, I didn't just do mortgage possessions. I did, uh, they also did bankruptcy hearings. Yep. They also did road traffic accidents, polite delay claims, which I'd never heard of. Uh, and also some minor contractual disputes. So, I mean, certainly it's a good opportunity to get cross-examination experience, for example, from road traffic accidents in a situation where you're just saying, you know, you jumped the red light, didn't you? Rather than, you know, you killed that man, didn't you? I mean, it's a slightly lower stakes <laughs> form of cross-examination. And I should also say in defense of Sam that everybody who sat in the chair that he's in, the person who's on the panel who doesn't have pupillage, has then gone on to get pupillage. So, uh, and I was one of them. So uh, Sam's in good company. Um, if we've got one quick question from anyone in the room, we're running slightly behind. So I've just, if you've got a quick question, fire it away. Otherwise, save it to the end. Good, I pressured everybody out of asking a question. <laughs> Fabulous. Harriet, your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Harriet. Um, so a bit about my background. I first did a history degree at the University of St. Andrews, and I always knew that I was kind of interested in law, and I did some work experience in university vacations. Um, but then I truly committed, and I decided to do the affiliate law degree, the senior status law degree at Cambridge, which is essentially where... They compress a three-year law degree into two years, which is as horrific as it sounds. Um, and I graduated from that uh, last summer. Um, and whilst I was at university, um, I decided to write a law dissertation and I chose to write it on weddings law. And through that, I found out about the Law Commission's project on weddings law. And I applied and um, joined at the same time as Matt to the Law Commission. And I worked there from last July until about a month ago. Um, <laughs> so I started the role as a judicial assistant in October. And typically you kind of, well, you all join as a cohort. So there's about 25 of us who are all the new judicial assistants. So bear with me. I don't fully know the role yet, but none of us do. We're still working on it. Um, but yeah, that was a tip for the Law Commission is normally you kind of apply and you start the same thing you do kind of September cohort. But if you say that you're keen to start earlier, you can sometimes. So I don't know, maybe I came across as really keen in my interview, but that was a little tip. Um, I, I don't know, briefly to mention a little bit about the Law Commission, not to cross over too much with what Matt was saying, but when I was doing my written application, I found the top tips on the Law Commission's website invaluable. Um, it was a really good source, which kind of gave you lots of detailed guidance and guidance on the application. <sighs> this is a really boring top tip, but like the STAR method, like it genuinely works in the interviews. So that's the thing I don't know, I don't want to talk down to you, but it the stomach that the situation task action result and 
slight curveball. I haven't got pupillage either, but that's because I've got a training contract lined up. Um, so I don't know whether I should be here. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. um, yeah, hi. Um, <laughs> But genuinely, when I employed that method in all of my interviews, I don't know, it really worked. So that's a, a tip. Um, <laughs> um, what else could I say about that? Um, yeah, so I, I loved my job at the Law Commission. Typically, your contract is only for 12 months, um, but there are options to extend. Um, I mean, I extended for a little bit, and that he's, he's still there. So <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. So it's a good option, but, you know, you can't rely on that fact. Um, but yes, lots of the skills that I learned at the Law Commission, I don't know, lots of admin skills, which were really useful. Um, you know, there's lots of minute writing and you have to kind of attend these long, they are quite long, um, policy meetings. Um, but essential for those policy meetings, you have to have kind of read the information and understand what the topic is to write kind of a coherent minute, which is useful. Um, you know, you've got to know what's going on. Um, there are great things of like legal research, um, which as Matt said, there's lots of good comparative analysis. Um, and, you know, the research that I did and some research memos ended up in the final report, um, the final, final weddings report. It helps with presentation skills, public speaking skills, interpersonal skills. So a lot of the time you meet with stakeholders. So the weddings project, you know, we're meeting people like the Church of England. It's like, oh, I'll dress smartly for that day and at work and just, you know, and it just how to hold yourself in a meeting. And I found that was uh, really useful. And yeah, I think my favorite part was um, the peer review meeting, which is when you get all the commissioners kind of ripping to shreds your ideas. You just kind of defend them fiercely. Um, but yes, yeah, so whilst I was at the Law Commission, I applied for the role of a judicial assistant um, at the Court of Appeal. Typically, um, JAs, you're assigned one judge. I've got two. Um, I've got Lady Justice Andrews and Lord Justice Stuart Smith. Um, as I said, I only started the role a month ago, so I don't know, at the beginning, it feels a little bit like work experience. You're just sitting around, just like, how can I help um, attending hearings? But it's also invaluable experience. So one of my first meetings with the judge, um, she said, Harriet, this is the closest you'll get to pupillage. And I went, ah, not, I mean, not never, but I, I'm not doing that quite yet. Um, but most of the other JAs, um, they're all either have got pupillage or they're going to be applying in the next year. Um, and I think that's one of the good parts of the job is that, I don't know, there's a sense of camaraderie between them. Um, either, I don't know, and they're all genuinely lovely people um, who are doing the JA role, but I think when the application process, um, I don't know, unravels over the next year, I'll probably just, I'll just witness it, but you know, I'm sure I'll try and help proofread some applications or whatever, but I don't know, they're all in it together, which is nice for them. Um, a bit about the uh, job, you don't actually need to have the bar course um, or even the LPC, like I don't have that yet, so don't be put off, whereas I know with the Supreme Court uh, JA role, you do have to be qualified, so I don't know, scratch that for now, um, do that in the future. Um, the application process, um, it was pretty standard. It was a written application, um, which was a CV. Um, it's very similar to the Law Commission application. I must admit that I kind of copied and pasted most of it. Um, you had to do a 250 word statement on suitability, um, a 250 word statement on evidencing the behavior. So it's civil service language, you know, of working together. But I'd recommend on those things, looking at the civil service website and looking at the different behaviors, things like working together to see that, I mean, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a tick boxing exercise that they do with it, but to kind of really exemplify the behavior and make sure that your answers do um, are tailored um, so that when they're kind of scorecarding your application, they can see that you're using the correct buzzwords and giving the correct examples for it. Um, there's also the interview, um, the first thing you had to do was, it was a delightful email to get um, the pre-reading for the interview, where you had to choose, um, for me it was out of three different judgments, and they gave Supreme Court judgments to us. So what I also did as well as reading the Supreme Court judgment was read what the Court of Appeal said, because you know it was for a Court of Appeal JA job. Um, so just see what things have been changed. And the interview, 
they essentially tested you on um, how you'd synthesize that case and got you to present it to the interviewer who was for me, one of the Lord Justices and one of the masters. Um, you also had to sit an exam on the day, which um, was slightly unpleasant because you had to do it and then they printed it off and then went through it with you in the interview. And the first thing they said to me is, Harriet, I can tell that you ran out of time. And I was like, did I? <laughs> I didn't realize that I had run out of time, but I'd missed like a sub part of a question. So once again, as I don't know, all your parents or whatever would say, read the question and answer the question. Um, but yeah, so that was quite time pressured, um, but I, I, I can't reckon, there's not really any practice that you can do for it. Um, it's just one of those things you give it a go on the day, they give you some facts and some law and they just get you to kind of synthesize it and write a little piece on what's going on and what would you recommend would happen next. Um, and the interview was also things like questions based on the working together behavior and other strength based questions. So pretty standard interview questions. Yeah, the application process it normally opens in March time and it's not open for a very long time. So do, I don't know, don't do what I did and just submit it on the last day. Um, but it's only open for, I think it was like two to three weeks. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, and then the interviews are usually within a two week period in May. But the role itself, from what I've learned thus far in my few days there, um, you should <laughs> you do things like help uh, assist in the preparation of cases before a hearing. So you analyze uh, appeal papers, you do things like conduct legal research, you help a lot of the time drafting summaries. So this could be a case summary or you could do things like draft a press summary on a case. Um, you help with petitions to appeal. So see if you know, a lot of the time you get landed with a watch of papers, which is someone's petition to appeal and you read through it first and think, oh, is this worthy of an appeal or should we just dismiss it? So it's quite important work that you're doing. Um, you, one of the main things that I've been doing thus far is writing bench memos. So these are big documents for the judges um, who sit on the bench for a case and you do things like explore, I basically you get given the bundles first for the case. And what you're doing is you're synthesizing all the information in that case, writing it in a nice memo. So when the judge is stressed and they've got, I don't know, eight cases on one week, they'll turn to your beautiful memo first, which will correctly summarize everything that's going on. And it kind of cuts down some of their reading time. I'm hoping that it's a skill that develops over time. Um, and so it takes a while. Um, but yeah, so there in the memories, you discuss things like the nature of the case, the factual and procedural background, see what decision is being appealed, look at the grounds for appeal, look at the submissions of both sides. And then you also get to talk about the merits of the case so and have a bit of an opinion on it. And that's when you can do some of your legal research. Um, but yeah, so as I say, at the beginning, the role, it does feel a bit like work experience. Um, you just kind of sit and listen on the hearings. But it's great that you get to attend the pre and post court meetings, which is something, well, one of my judges actually sat in the Privy Council in my second week there. So I got to snoop in a bit on the Supreme Court and what their JAs do, but they're not allowed to attend any of those meetings, which is when you get the kind of real juice where you see the judges kind of like debating with each other, you know, actually, I think I'm going to dissent. And it's like, oh no, okay. <laughs> But so I don't know, but that, that is an invaluable experience. And um, Lord Justice Stuart Smith, in my first meeting with him, he said, Harriet, what you'll learn from this next year is how judges think. And he said that will be invaluable for you in your pupillage. Um, <laughs> um, yes. And I didn't, you get involved in other um, schemes and things like that. So last week we had some interns from Bridging the Bar, um, which is a, a great initiative, which also the Law Commission um, gets involved in and I kind of got to show this intern around the Court of Appeal and she got to attend all um, the different meetings too um, so you could be a bit of a mentor um, what was I doing today today uh, Lord Justice Stuart Smith gave me one of his judgments and he said all right just proofread this and tell me uh, tell me what you think and tell me that I'm not wrong and I was like okay um, so I went away and did that um, but yes, you have to be open-minded, I think is one thing for the job, that in the interview I kind of pre uh, prefaced that I had a real interest for family law, and I've got two judges who don't do family law, um, but you know, <laughs> but it's great experience in the sense you get a wide um, 
sense of, I don't know, different areas of law and a lot of the cases that I've been working on in this last week um, have been criminal law cases, which is, again, something that I don't have particular interest in practicing in the future. But it's all, you know, things about transferable skills. And I genuinely, I think it's a brilliant job. And if you can have the opportunity to apply for it, I think it's a great environment. It's a convivial environment. All the judges thus far have been genuinely lovely. Um, and yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I'm, it's, it's an excellent thing for your CV, but I think it's it can kind of confirm what areas of law you're most interested in. And one thing that's nice about all the other JAs is we all sit in this one big room together. So you kind of, each JA comes in each morning after visiting their judge and you can see oh, what's been going on, what are you working on? And even if you're, I, I don't know, I sit next to one JA who is um, with a family law judge and I kind of listen and learn by osmosis through them. So it's a very educational experience. Um, there we go. Good, thank you very much. Uh, Harry, for that. Um, unfortunately, on this occasion, we actually have run out of time with you. Uh, almost. Sorry. We have time for one question if anyone wants to ask one. We don't have one online. Does anyone in the room want to ask? Yes, go ahead. Would you earn? Oh, how much would you earn roughly um, in well, general? Uh, as in, okay. More well, the Law Commission. At the Law Commission or What's the law commission yeah. at? 28, 29? 29. 29. There's a, there's a rivalry between JAs J is more. and the law commission, and we swap every year. <laughs> and we, I think the right route to go is go from less money to more. Yeah. <laughs> so I know people have come the other way, and then they're like, wow, let's do it. Eating pasta for lunch every day, <laughs> homemade, like on a Sunday for the week, <laughs> is the answer. But yeah, so law comms about 29k a year and um court of appeal is about 35 getting towards 36 it helps to have a judge negotiating on your bar yeah. <laughs> get in with them <laughs> yeah no i think that's i think it's a really important question yeah. because i think one of my personal bugbears about the, the pathway to pupillage is that it's very opaque in terms of how much or little money you will earn Certainly pupillage itself is now better at advertising how much money you will earn, but tenancy is, is much less so. So I think one of the key questions that we should actually ask at the bar, because, you know, solicitors, it's all very plain. It's very easy. They'll tell you, you know, you'll earn some of the American firms will pay you £100,000 a year to be a trainee. You'll have no life, so they admit. <laughs> but, you know, they're very, they're very, very transparent about the amount of money um, that you earn. I think at the bar should be better for that, because if we're all spending the inordinate amounts of money that we have to spend on the bar course. I think we should know, shouldn't we, how much or little we might earn afterwards. Though for our criminal friends, um, mm. I think that's a particular issue, which mm. I'm personally quite sad about. But there we are. That was the one promised question for uh, <laughs> Harriet. Don't worry. Thank you very much. Um, right, so good evening, everyone. Um, as Adam mentioned, I practice it, well, I'm at Field Court Tax, so pretty much uh, do what it says on the tin. I do tax. Surprise, surprise. Um, I also do general commercial. Um, how did I get here? I originally, like Harriet, I did history. I, I read history at UCL. Um, I then went on and did a uh, condensed the senior status law degree because I couldn't quite decide what I wanted to do. And I wasn't, I wanted to do law. So I thought, well, I'll go off and do a degree and I'll compress it into two years and that would be great. Um, then I decided, um, uh, by this point, I was so keen on what I wanted to do. I had I had done an umpteen number of mini pupillages. I won't tell you how many, because even to me at this point, I'm like, that was a little bit excessive. <laughs> I don't come from a family of lawyers. So I, I tried to use everything I could. I, I worked as a legal secretary in summers. I, um, I you know... I went off and did VAC schemes, you know, I, I was like, I want to, I just want to be a lawyer. But the more and more I saw of the bar, the more I, I really, you know, to use the American expression, I really leaned into wanting to be a barrister. Um, so I finished my senior studies, I finished my law degree and then decided I'm gonna go off and do my bar exams. I, you know, I have, I have, I am here, I've arrived, I did my bar exams, I was feeling, pretty good about it I made pupillage applications um and at the time you can make 12 I don't know if that's still the case and I sort of I was like you know I was like well I'm gonna be really smart I'm gonna do six and I'm gonna do four criminal four civil 
for common law. Not smart at all. I got a couple of first round interviews. I got some second round interviews. I had no offers. I can talk about this now with a slight smile on my face. At the time I was crestfallen. I genuinely was. I had put everything I thought I had into that. And I thought, but what else could you want? It wasn't so much, was it an ego bruising maybe? Um, but, but there was a part of me that was like, what else could you possibly want? Um, yes, I didn't go to Oxbridge for my undergrad. Uh, yes, I, you know, I haven't got, you know, the top first. But, you know, I'm super keen. I'm not, you know, the, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm really, I feel like I'm engaged with the law. I've done experience. I've done all these things. And I was, I was deeply, deeply crestful. And I was like, well, I don't, I, I didn't really know what to do. Um, at that point, and I'll come back to this point later on, um, I turned to the inn. Um, the inn had been a source of support and I'd been sort of involved. I was involved in debating. I was involved in some of the student societies. Um, but I sort of, I had some, you know, they, they were slightly aware of who I was. I was slightly aware of who they were. Um, but get involved with the inn. That's another tip I would, I would really, really encourage you to do. I would not be here today, truthfully, in a large part because of what the inn did for me. They gave me a mentor. Um, she was brilliant. Um, I, at the time I applied to, uh, to this uh, program in New York and I got on, I went there, I did six months at UBS, six months at Deutsche Bank. It was brilliant. Um, but at the time I wasn't going to go. I spoke to her and she said, well, she said, you've just finished. Everything is not lost. Don't be so dramatic. Pull your socks up. She, she was, she, she was, she is, we're still in contact. Brilliant. Um, but she, she didn't do my work for me, but she helped me realize a few things that I hope I can share with you now. Um, but I'll quickly go through what I did. Um, so after New York, I realized, okay, uh, don't know what to do. I'm going to borrow your phrase, um, uh, Sam, and did a panic masters, decided, right, don't, don't know what to do, gonna go do masters. Um, went and did a masters, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to Oxford, I don't think that was the make or break though, funnily, because I didn't apply that year. Um, I then went off to what I had done. One of the VAC schemes I had done was a law firm. Didn't know which department to sit in. I didn't know the difference between structured finance and leverage finance. I was like, mm, yeah, sure, I'll sit in whichever seat you want me to be in. One of them was tax. I was really, really surprised at how much I enjoyed it, but really surprised. So I thought, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to continue. One of the bits of advice that was given to me was build your CV in a proactive way. Show what you can, you've got to evidence that you've got these skills. You can't just say you're good at advocacy. Where's the evidence? You can't say you're good at drafting. Where's the evidence? And drafting in an academic context is very, very different to drafting in a practical context. And I learned that the really hard way because I was like, I can write to you these beautiful, long, effusive documents. No one cares about that in practice. I remember, um, and, and I went off, I got I got offers from, from Deloitte, from PwC. I went off to Deloitte. Um, and that was a deliberate choice on my part because at the time they had a big dispute resolution team, which wasn't as popular as they now are in the big four. Um, and I was there as part of the graduate program. I did my charter tax exams with them. But whilst I was there, I realized I was like, I really, really enjoy the law. Don't really enjoy everything else that comes with this. I'm not very good at timesheet filling in. I'm not very good at certain other things, but I really enjoy the law. So I applied for pupillage. This time my success rate was much better. I didn't use up my 12 applications, but every application I did was targeted. It was focused. I knew exactly what I wanted. Um, certainly much more than I did a few years prior and ended up with some offers. I went off to four to five Grayson Square and I did a mixed pupillage in that it was very, at the time, it's changed a little bit now. Um, it was very much known for public law, general commercial, and they had a very concentrated set of tax practitioners, which was attractive to me because I was like, well, I don't know if I want to do pure tax yet. Do I want to do something else? Um, I was always like constantly like hedging, you know, what, what is it I want to do? What is it I don't want to do? It was a very, very good decision that I did that. Um, I got to work on a, an enormous range of cases. Pupillage was tough. It was grueling. But I, what was really interesting to me was throughout my pupillage interviews, 
was I thought, you know, people are going to ask me about, you know, the two masters that I've done. People are going to ask me about, you know, the depth of my thesis on like this, this analysis or that nobody cared. What they wanted to know was what I'd been doing practically at work. I think maybe two interviews asked me about my, the, my dissertations that I'd written. The rest, every single interview asked me practically what I had done. How did that translate? So when Harriet mentioned STAR, I know you shyly giggled, but I actually wholeheartedly agree with that because everything you do should be and ought to be, and it's what you will do as a barrister in court, is evidence base. You cannot present a proposition to the court. You cannot ask them to make a finding without supporting what you have with evidence. And the same goes for yourself. You cannot say, I am the best drafts person you will ever come across. And if you don't have me, you're really missing a trick here. They want to know, what have you done? And that doesn't mean you need to go off and write the constitution for some small island nation state. Because one of the big concerns people have is, I don't have this glorious glittering CV. And it's true. There are some phenomenal, phenomenal barristers out there. But everybody is phenomenal in their own way. It's what lens do you see it from? And what's the thing that really resonates with you? There are some really phenomenal barristers out there who don't earn an incredible amount, but the amount of pro bono work they do, the amount of a tangible difference they make to people's lives on a daily basis is really quite remarkable. Then there are people who do write constitutions for small island nation states. But you have to ask yourself, what is it I have done that can show I'm really good at advocacy, actually, or I am really engaged in a critically analytical way with the law. What is it I can do to show that I'm good at drafting? And you're not going to be the perfected product. There is a reason my pupil master told me this. He said, never ever think about this as just a job. He said, there's a reason it's a vocation. It's because you and you are in practice. It's because you're continually building. And it's such a humbling thought. And it has genuinely kept me I hope I hope um quite grounded to remember that I'm not the perfected product even at this stage and I will constantly look back at drafts and be like right okay I need to do this to improve it step away step away and that's what you should be doing with your applications so this comes on to my sort of top tips in terms of what I think were the most useful useful things and I now sit on the other side of the table where I have many pupils I'm a trained pupil supervisor I interview pupils for, or prospective pupils for um, pupillage in chambers. Um, the first is do your homework and research properly. When I look back at my applications the first time around, I sort of, I cringe a little bit inside. I'm like, oh, Dilpree, what did, like, what were you thinking? Like, did you really think that you were going to go out and be like a crusade for like human rights? And I remember <laughs> someone saying to me, what do you want to do? And I was like, human rights, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the sexy answer. That's the right answer. That's what, you know, everybody does. And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, well, hum human rights, it's self-evident, isn't it? It's axiomatic. It speaks just what it says on the tin. And I what do you mean? I was like, well, rights of humans. But I hadn't done my research properly. I just thought that was what I might want to do. I'd not given any real, and I'm not saying you need to commit to a practice area. When I went into pupillage, I wasn't committed to a practice area. What I, did, what I did know was I was really drawn to certain practice areas more than others. Um, and that's, and that must have come through in my interviews um, because I, I had a very rewarding uh, pupillage as a result. And when I say do your homework and research properly, that doesn't mean troll through said chamber's website, uh, know who all the individuals are, um, sort of wonder if your CV looks broadly comparable and then think, yeah, I'll give it a go because, you know, my CV looks like it might match. No, really understand what is this chambers about? And there are things that you can do that help you with that. So again, use the in. It is an immense resource here for you at your disposal. There are just the loveliest people who are there, like Anna and Clara and others, who um, who are so friendly, who are so accessible. I did not leverage it as much as I should have done. I have learned in time to do that. But as I said, I would not be here but for the inn, and I wish I'd done it a few years earlier. Um, and on doing your homework and research properly, why does that matter with the inn? Because it will give you access to people like this. So as Adam said, you know, we're sitting before you, you can ask any of us questions. There are other talks, other events you will go to. Be engaged, be interested and interesting, not in a super, superficial way, but there are things that will naturally pique your interest. So, you know, Matt, when you were talking about, you know, driverless cars, 
you you literally came to life and you were like, I, I couldn't tell you about the commercial civil chair. I don't even know what they're called. Um, the second thing is be true to yourself, which comes onto my point, be authentic. Don't think you need to present a particular front. This is a really long profession. I mean, there are people in their 80s and 90s doing this job. Trust me, you're going to be exhausted if you try and pretend to be somebody else. The other thing is, because barristers pick up on this, that's what we do. It's what we're trained to do, right? It's a spidey sense. You're like, that there's, something's not clicking when that person's in front of you. Be true about who you are. Be honest about what you've done. You don't have to have the most fantastical, complicated example, but if you can present it well, if you can use a star method, you're probably going to be a few steps, if not, you know, a number of steps ahead of other candidates who come before us who sound like they're about to give a really good explanation, but they're sort of whiffling along and you're like, I, I, I don't know where this is going. Did you save the small island nation state? Are they now destitute peoples? I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Um, the third is treat the applications, treat every stage you do, not just your pupillage, but your law commission, you do your judicial assistance, your paralegaling, your legal secretary, whatever it is, with the gravitas it deserves. So I'm currently on the attorney general's panel. I'm um, sorry, I was just looking at Adam's time, I was whizzing along there. I'm, and that's, and the reason I say it is not to blow my own trumpet, contrary to the image that most barristers portray otherwise. The reason I say it's probably because that's the most recent application I've done that to me felt like doing a pupillage application again. Why? Because it was entirely evidence-based. I approached it though with the gravity, I think, I hope it deserved, which is I would sit and ruminate on a single question of 300 words, 250 words, um, not in a kind of whimsical sense. I was like, yeah, no, I'm really bored by this. I'm going to go away because I'm not going to produce anything useful. But giving yourself enough time to do it. I thought about my bullet points well in advance, and don't be mistaken, just because you put something down on paper that you've got something substantive, think, engage your mind. So I definitely thought about it a lot more than I wrote anything down. The fourth thing is think really, really, really hard why you want to come to the bar. Almost every pupillage interview, almost every judicial assistant role, or you know, even if they haven't quite appreciated you're going off to do a training contract. <laughs> or, Oh, they, they did they didn't appreciate it. Oh, okay, yeah. fine. Well, I, I thought yeah. your judge was still saying when you go off to well, pupillage. The judges oh, yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> but the, the, the point is, you have to think if you're applying for pupillage, why do you want to come to the bar? It's really easy to say because I want autonomy. I say it's easy, but you know, to, to roll off the answer, I want autonomy. I like advocacy. I'm really good at drafting. I like problem solving. That doesn't, what does that mean? Think really hard for yourself why you want to come. To, to the bar and that's not to stop you it's not to to hinder you but being at the bar requires more than just a glittering cv or a top oxbridge first because not everybody has that that's the reality it requires grit it requires determination it requires the ability to pull your socks up at the end of the day and say you've just got a massive rollicking from a judge but you know i've got another case tomorrow and i've got a client con to deal with the day after that and I might have, you know, 2% of a life somewhere in between. So try and, you know, retain the three friends I still have. Um, the other the other thing is it's, and remember, it's the art of persuading the person in front of you that you're worth it. If you don't believe in yourself that you're good enough and you are not convinced as to your reasons about why you want to go to the bar, honestly, how are you going to convince somebody else? You've got, and it's not believing in, in, in a superficial way, like I'm so great, I'm the answer, like look at me, I'm you know, dressed the part. You've really, really got to know why you want to do this because it is a lifelong commitment in many senses. That's not to say people don't come and then leave the bar, of course they do, or you can't come to the bar later, of course you can, I came a bit later. But once you're in it and you, you're building a practice, when they want to see, when they interview your you for pupillage they're not thinking oh yeah do you think like yeah, this person will be fine for pupillage no they're thinking can this person be a tenant here in the long term will this person be a contributing valuable member of chambers and in order to demonstrate that you need to show them why you know why you want to come to the bar and the last point is don't undervalue your experiences so that comes back to you don't have to have written a constitution for a small island nation state you may have worked in your local authority, a, a local law centre. You may have done a great thing by going off to, you know, to the law commission or doing county court advocacy. I didn't do any of those things, but I did not. I don't think by the time it came to the second round, undervalue what I had done. I, I, I really said, you know, 
I was really keen, but these are the reasons why I did this work experience. I wasn't wholly decided at that point, but I can sit in front of you now and tell you that the route I took is this, here is why I took it. And there are many, many different reasons why people take different routes. Don't be embarrassed of those. Don't hide away from those. Don't don't feel that, oh, well, do you know, I need to support myself. That is an incredible thing if you're having to support yourself through this because it's tough. What does that show? You've already evidenced, you've got grit, you've got determination. The fact that you are committed to wanting to come to the bar, it speaks volumes, but you've shown that through evidence without telling me you've got grit and determination, you're committed to coming to the bar. Um, and, and the beauty of the bar, I'd say, don't forget these things as well. As I said, the inn, I got um, a couple of scholarships from the inn. I've had mentors through the inn. They offer the opportunity for marshalling. They offer the, the opportunity for the pupillage foundation scheme. There are so many opportunities. I like, I come across things. I'm like, oh, do, do, do we do that? I didn't know we did that. Um, there are so many. So be, act, be an active member of the inn, be an active member of that community. Um, and, and the second is, I hope that you know that there's no set route to join, that if you haven't done a certain thing or you, You've taken a slightly different route. That doesn't matter. There are, yeah, there are, there are, <laughs> that's it. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, yeah, that's what I want to say. Thank you so much. No, sorry. That was my very unsubtle way. Of... She only had a minute it left. Needed. Needed. I'm also going to need my fair. piece of paper back from you. Thank you. Um, Clara, can you just let us know what time you, about 10 more minutes. Okay. I've got two or three more minutes of things I just wanted to say in general summary. Um, because I say I've been on this panel a few times. I am now a second year tenant at Harcourt Chambers doing family law. So I have been involved, you know, as Dilbury says, being involved in the inn is vital. I've been involved in the inn since I was at City Law School doing my um, BPTC, as it was then, which makes me apparently sound like a dinosaur because it's <laughs> changed about six times. But the inn certainly has been a really important part of my journey, but it also has helped me meet lots of other students, lots of other people. So I, I like to think I've I've kind of tried to kind of see the broad picture. I think one of the best things that um, Dilbert really got across is this point about, and I say this quite a lot, is that the bar is your opportunity to build your own grad scheme. If you go to a bank or if you go to a uh, big four accountancy firm, they will put you through the paces that, and mold you into the person they want you to be. And they'll give you the skills that they want you to have. Whereas you have a unique, actually, if you, and when I thought about it this way, it actually felt more exciting to me that I had the opportunity to go and do any job. I mean, I think the panel along here, it, it, you should go away thinking that you could be a judicial assistant, you could be a law con, you could go into um, county privacy, you could go and work at a bank. You can literally do whatever you want as long as you can in some way spin it towards giving you a set of skills that helps and bolsters your pupillage applications. To give you an example, I know people who have run, not just worked in, ran a coffee shop for three years, four years. I know people who have had entire careers doing completely different things, for example, in banks, who have then come to do family law. So it's not even like they're doing commercial law. You know, you can, if you distill down the skills and the things you've learned across the wide variety of your life, you can spin any of that to help bolster your pupillage application. Um, for example, another uh, really big point is volunteering. And I'm, shameless plug, I run a charity uh, that teaches uh, the law in schools that tries to kind of give people a better, more holistic understanding of their rights and responsibilities. Doesn't mean you all need to go out and start your What's own charity. What's their charity? Uh, Legicate, yeah, shameless plug. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, like, if you're going to plug it, like, yeah, we'll do it properly. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. point. No, I should. <laughs> yeah, I did not employ the star method. So <laughs> I am in the bad books already. So, yeah, Legislate is a great charity. But for example, you've heard a lot about charities tonight. You've heard about Fruit, you've heard about law centers, Citizens Advice is another great one. Anywhere that essentially gives you, and this is the key point for me, was I went out hungry for decisions. I wanted to go somewhere to make decisions to be given responsibility because ultimately I can tell you as a family law barrister now that is the number one job spec is you are given somebody's life in your hands in one way or another and whether it's a commercial whether it's criminal whether it's family you have somebody somewhere's life in your hands whether it's an extraordinary amount of money that a company has or whether it's somebody's children or whether it's how many years in prison somebody has the this job gives you a unique access to decisions and if you can go and do any job and you can spin to anybody, I had to make a set of decisions under a pressured circumstance. That could be in hospitality. That could be, as I say, I keep saying it in a bank, but it could be anywhere. 
where you are forced to make decisions under pressure that will impact upon other people's lives. The, I, I know somebody who spun being on the rugby team as indicative of their commitment to being able to wake up early in the morning, having to you know do team rosters, having to be a part of a, a wider team and endure physical pain. I can guarantee that the bar is going to cause you too much physical pain, um, but that's just uh, an example. Um, so yes, as I say, you know, one of the key questions, and I'm sorry that we don't necessarily have all the time to go through all of the questions that have been pre-submitted in advance, but it was just a spotlight on a couple, and I'll ask some of the panel to, to give their view as well. But one, a recurring theme, which I'm particularly aware of, is people saying, well, if I don't have a first class degree, firstly, or if I don't have a degree from Oxbridge, am I going to survive at the bar? Now, you've heard a lot of people on the panel who have some experience from Oxbridge, but I can hold my hand up and tell you, I, I got a 2-1 degree from the University of Nottingham. I didn't do a master's. I went out straight from Nottingham. I went to do the bar at City. I then did LBC Law, and I did a very, very short stint, which turned out to be very lucky because that was just before COVID. I did a very short stint at a commercial litigation firm uh, of solicitors being paralegal. And that's it. I, I didn't do any extra study. I have not had any experience at all of Oxbridge. And one of the things that a lot of people ask is, well, how do, do I make my application shine? And one thing is to remember is that a first class degree from anywhere doesn't give you emotional intelligence or client facing skills or the ability to draft effectively for practice, as you've heard from many people on the panel. Skills and things you can demonstrate, in my view, are, are the most important thing. Of course, your academics are important and the things that you learn, the skills that you learn from your legal drafting and your ability to work hard and meet tight deadlines, all of these things are the things you take with you from your academic progress, but they don't define you. And that doesn't mean one, if you don't have excellent glowing academics, that shouldn't weigh you down. But equally, if you do, don't hide behind it because there is a lot more to being a barrister than just being clever, because there are quite a few clever barristers. There are some less clever barristers, I can, yeah, I can, I can tell you. Um, but certainly cleverness is not the, the number one factor. Everybody has that to an extent. It's about what you've demonstrated you've done along the way. So in, in a nutshell, I think what I've learned from the panel tonight is that experience means everything, that there is a wide range of experience out there available for you. If you just go and hunt for it and follow your nose in that sense, things you're interested in, will generally reveal your practice area. I initially started off life thinking I wanted to be Harvey Specter. I was going to go and do commercial law and I was going to swan around in an expensive suit and do expensive sounding things. And now I ended up in family law. <laughs> How? I have no idea. I literally did the module at university because it was that or wildlife law. And I did it <laughs> the, on the bar course because, uh, again, it was that or, you know, human rights of which I knew nothing. Um, and so now I end up doing family law and I love it. And it's every day... I do bounce out of bed uh, for family law, not quite for credit hire, but certainly for, uh, for family law. And all it takes is for you to find that for yourselves. And practice is the best way of doing it. So enough from me. We don't have any questions again online. Everybody's gone. Oh, no, we do have some questions online. I just forgot to scroll down. So <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, I'll take one question from here first. Oh, excellent. Actually, Sam, I think this would be an interesting one for you. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, uh, what would you recommend for those who are studying online and cannot get to London to do a lot of the opportunities at the end? But I also think that that's generally things in London. So actually, Matt, Sam, Sam if you both want to answer that, Sam, if you go to us. Yeah, I think certainly now more so than the in the, the, the sort of more recent history, a lot of the opportunities aren't necessarily um ones that you have to do in person or certainly at least if there's a training period involved if you want to get involved with a particular sort of experience the training period won't necessarily be in person um in a lot of those sorts of things so you can leverage your experience fairly quickly i think without necessarily having to be london-based i think much like matt i wasn't london-based and, and saw a, a fairly early opportunity to get down here after i finished my studies um, if you if you want to get here and find uh, experience in London, I think there is so much to offer um, as long as you can be open minded about the sort of skill set that you're trying to develop. Um, and yeah, be a, a little bit entre entrepreneurial, I think, about um, the opportunities um, and your general direction. Um, yeah. No. I just echo what Dilpert said and use the in like I did my bar course and it was all online. But we still managed to do mooting and debating um, and that was a great experience all the qualifying sessions there was talks 
online and now in this virtual world is amazing because you can just log on to um cases or hearings up and down the country i would attend some and if i really enjoyed what the barrister was saying i would send them an email and be like i found this submission really interesting and barristers love talking about themselves and their work so if you send an email like that they would be like wow and so i managed to get just a many people from that just because i was really interested in this case and had been following it so I think it's just using your initiative and for me like I knew I needed more London experience if I wanted to practice down here so it was applying to the Law Commission and um, applying to Liberty and doing some volunteering with them again that was all virtual so there are lots of opportunities out there um, and don't think you have to be in London to get all of these it's just about just being a bit aware and getting in touch with the inn or just attend and say like the pupillage fair and just showing an interest that's all online now and if you really are interested in a chambers uh, or um, a certain barrister, half the time, just send them an email, but go to them with your questions. Don't just say, oh, how does my application stand out? Go to them and say, I, I saw you did this. Can you just tell me um, how your practice, how you how, how you develop this practice? Or can you tell me a bit more about this specific case and, and what you thought about it? And then if you go with those specific questions, then... I think a barrister is much more inclined to give you a, a bit more time a day than these general ones that they can't really help with. All great stuff. Any questions in the room? Yes, you, sir, with the tie. <laughs> We're in a minority. Yet. There's not many of us who wear ties. Um, so particularly for Dilpri, um, you said a lot of really interesting things. I've been scribbling away furiously, but um, you mentioned about getting to know what the chambers are actually about. So, you know, the sort of culture and spirit of the chambers. How... What specific actions would you suggest for finding out other than sort of minis? So other than minis, I would say a lot of chambers now like to um, market themselves. Uh, they will do talks. They um, put out blogs, bulletins, podcasts. I know my chambers, we issue a very riveting read, should any of you care to indulge in it, mm -hmm. called the Field Court Tax Digest. It is a riveting read in which we all contribute articles of interest every month. Um, but that tells you a bit about the flavor of the set that you're going to. Um, you know, there's the pupillage fairs, you know, which chambers were interested enough to, to pitch up? What, what, you know, what are the, who are the sorts of people they've sent along? What are they saying about themselves? Um, so I think other than, other than um, the obvious mini pupillage, there are lots of ways that chambers market themselves subtly. You know, they say they do aviation and shipping, but do they actually, you know, have a look at the cases they've been involved in? Go a bit deeper than what, the website is telling you um and you get a feel for actually does this set really do this or you know are they really about something else there's no harm looking at the directories i i take those with a pinch of salt but they give a bit of an indication as to okay where are some of the superstars sitting truly in this practice area you know and, uh, and is this a, a sort of a presentation of yes we do aviation and shipping but you know, one guy did it once about seven years ago, and it was vaguely connected to an aeroplane. And so they say they do aviation. Um, so, so that gives you a flavor of what chambers are doing, what they're actually like, um, where do they operate, which jurisdictions are you interested in international work? I am. So I went to a, you know, I, I moved set, I went to field court tax chambers for a couple of reasons, but all those things should, you know, continue to inform you, even at, even at the understanding what chambers are like stage and you've got to be honest with yourself not just they've got the best website so you know they seem to be really raking it in you've got to <laughs> ask yourself why is it that you are so attracted or drawn to this and be be if you know yourself and you've done your homework well both on the set and yourself you should be able to make those connections a lot quicker yeah Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, you said the only other person with a tie. I, I said that there were a few people with a tie. And you got one four, too. It's like four or five. There's actually quite a few. I've underestimated <laughs> the time. Um, what I wanted to say is, in terms of being international students, we um, experience sort of a different pressure mm. uh, with our uh, studies and with work experience in general. And uh, we get bamboozled as to the opportunities we have for work experience. And by the time we do uh, acquaint ourselves, I think we get crushed by exam pressure. Mm. So I think my question is, after um, passing the bar, what, we, what would be the best experience for 
so I mean, what would be the best uh, approach for an international student to get work experience relevant to pupillage? Do you mind if I take that? Yeah, please go ahead. The, the only reason I wanted to take that is because um, partway through when I was a junior junior tenant, I, for personal reasons, moved abroad to Dubai and I worked in a firm there. And one of the big, big warnings was your practice is going really well. You try and come back. It's going to be terrible. And I faced what I realized for the first time, my friends in the international sort of uh, forum in terms of when we were you know, juniors and finishing up the bar exams must have faced. And a lot of that is doing things of relevance. So I try to make sure in the three and a half years I was away, I did things that continue to be of relevance to the bar for when I decided to come back. So it's the same things we've all been talking about. Where can you get advocacy? Where can you get meaningful experience that you can talk about in terms of skill building? You can certainly do paralegaling work. You can do clinic work. You can do volunteering. You reminded me of Liberty. There are the pro bono prisons initiatives. I know that all the law schools, all the law providers now do them. Um, there are a phenomenal number of ways to showcase that you are both interested and interest, you, and you are interested in the law in particular, and you're interested in the skills and bi building and developing those skills. So as international students, I understand that there is that slight barrier, but it's not prohibitive. If you look at a number of chambers now, they have got a number of people who've cross qualified, so they've come from other jurisdictions, or who were international students here. and but, but what they did was to really build their skill base. And that was something that I took with me when I went abroad. Um, I'd gone to Dubai for three, three and a half years. But the one thing I had to remember, and it was the best bit of advice I was given was keep building those skills. Do not lose the skills that sort of helped you build your practice here or that you built during pupillage or that you built even before coming to pupillage because you lose those or there's an idea that you've lost those. Um, or you haven't been building on them, I mean, you, you're you're stagnant effectively. So you have to be doing the same things as your peers are doing who are, you know, UK based as it were. I think a general comment on that is, is we've talked a lot about the skills and we've talked about a lot about, you know, a holistic barrister in terms of advocacy, in terms of drafting, in terms of intellectual ability. I think one of the key things for me was being self-critical. I really enjoyed advocacy and I really, to use Dilpreet's Americanized term, lent into my identity as I wasn't going to be a, a legal researcher. I, I had no interest really. I didn't really enjoy reading judgments. What I enjoyed was being in sort of a county court gunslinging sort of in the trenches right, out in the Wild West. That's what I want. And that's my practice. The reason why I picked family law was because of the advocacy heavy pitch. Right. So having that moment of introspection and saying to yourself well what is it that I'm one I'm good at and two and I, I enjoy and having an element of focus I think one of the worst things you can kind of do is the later you go is you have a, if you don't have a focus in terms of the skills you want to, to, to hone it becomes very difficult to access support so for example Dilbury highlights every university has got an excellent careers advice service but they're not any good if you don't know what questions to ask them if you go to the careers advisor and say well get me a job it's not as effective as if you say to a careers advisor I need paralegaling experience please oh great yeah here are all the firms that are our, our partners i need counter court advocacy experience oh great here are all of the counter court advocacy firms let's help you let's talk to you about your application form unless you've done that moment of introspection to figure out one what you want to be and two what you're lacking it becomes very difficult to have direction and it doesn't necessarily mean that you again need to say that i want to be a specifically a tax lawyer in dubai for example <laughs> but you know having that broad understanding of what kind of skills you want to do will generally help how much longer have we got or should we should we we should be finished so thank you uh so much for your attention both online and in person thank you so much all for attending uh clara probably has some some things to tell you so uh this yes um just to echo adam i'd really like to thank our fantastic panel it, they were all really inspiring so thank you very much on behalf of the inn and adam for chairing as excellently as he always does um we do have a drinks reception next door if you'd like to join us hopefully some of the panel can